chapter 6, verses 41 through 51. John 6, 41 through 51. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught of God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And our second reading is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So we've been looking at one of the key or most well-known miracle stories surrounding the life of Jesus, and that was his feeding of the 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and some fish. And as we saw, that took place up in Bethsaida on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. And it took place at the time time of the Passover. And so all of the things that Jesus did, all the things that Jesus said, were all pointing towards demonstrating that he was the Christ, the Son of God. And the people recognized right away the significance of what was going on, and so they were ready to take Jesus by force. And so he backed off into the hills the next the evening, sent his disciples on ahead to Capernaum. And we know that story. They rode all through the night against fierce wind and waves, finally made it to the other side. Jesus caught up to them by walking on the water. And then the people caught up with them the next day by boat. <coughs> John chapter 6 is one of the pivotal chapters in the whole Gospel of John in that it contains some of the most practical lessons for living as Christians. And the reason for that is the context was the people were hungry and came to Jesus and they needed food. And food is the most basic need of day-to-day life. You could throw in water and breathing along with that. And what we have to consider is in that time the challenge of getting food compared to now. Because again, they can't drive down to the value mart of Giant Tiger and buy a loaf of bread, there you're, you are stuck. So it was a very real pressing need. And Jesus did give them their practical day-to-day needs. He fed them to the point where they were full. For some of them, it may have been years since the last time they actually ate their fill. And so it's in that context that we see his response to the people around him, which really gets to the heart of what should be at the core of daily life for each one of us. And so sometimes we miss what really is necessary for day-to-day life. So on the heels of that last week, what we saw was the crowds did catch up to Jesus and they got a lesson on satisfaction. And the lesson, the lesson was this, the message was this, Jesus invites us to come to him and to be satisfied. Because in verse 35 of chapter 6, he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And we looked at just how emphatically Jesus expressed that, that we will never hunger again and there will never be a moment of thirst in our life. And that same invitation is what closes the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. After, the, after Jesus has returned and we see the kingdom in its fullness, 
And then this invitation is left sitting there at the end of the Bible. The Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And let the one who is thirsty come. And let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. And so you would think that after the miraculous feeding and then this amazing invitation to come and be satisfied, at that point we would think that they lived happily ever after. But no, that wasn't the case. The response was at the same time shocking and yet not surprising. So here we encounter a little bit of deja vu. John 6.41, our first verse from this morning's reading. The Jews, therefore, were grumbling about him. Familiar with the book of Ecclesiastes? Remember that the writer said, there is nothing new under the sun. And surely here there's nothing new under the sun because this takes us back a few years to when we looked at the Exodus story. Remember that? Time and time again the people grumbled. Exodus 16, verse 2, And the whole congregation of the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So Jesus, the prophet Moses promised would come, is getting the same reception that the Israelites gave Moses himself and Aaron. They grumbled. Speaking of that event in the wilderness, Psalm 106 says this, Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe in his word, but grumbled in their tents. They did not listen to the voice of the Lord. Towards the end of the New Testament, Jude says this about people like that. These men are grumblers and fault finders. They follow their own evil desires. They boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Paul warns us as Christians, don't be like them. 1 Corinthians 10.10, 10, he says, don't grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. But the good news is you don't have to get up and run for the door. Today's message is not about grumbling. But rather, the powerful teaching opportunity their grumbling provided to Jesus. And so when we see how he responds to their grumbling, what he actually does is not so much answer the grumblers as he does start speaking to us, the believers, to give us the assurance that we have in him. And so today's passage is not about grumbling, it's about assurance. So what we're going to do is just do a quick overview of the passage to get a, to get a feel for the main ideas, and then we're going to look a little bit more closely at a couple of key details. So we look at the complaint. The Jews therefore were grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And they were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say I've come down out of heaven? So ultimately, their problem is a deep and persistent unbelief. Jesus came from that part of the country. Some of these people already knew Jesus. They probably knew him as a child. They knew his parents. And so it's just not clicking together the things they're hearing him say, the things they're seeing him do, with where they know that he came from, humanly speaking. And so they just simply don't believe, which again, like we read in Psalm 106 a slide ago, they did not believe his word, but grumbled in their tents. So the problem is a problem of unbelief. That's what we see with these grumblers. And we see the initial response of Jesus. He says, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So this is directly squared at those grumblers, but ultimately what it serves as is information for those in the crowd who are believers, and ultimately for us today who are reading this passage, so that we can understand why it is that some grumble and don't believe, and why it is that we believe. Because when we understand where our faith comes from, and why we believe, it gives us the security that God wants us to have in Jesus. And so, ultimately, what Jesus is identifying in this verse and the verses that follow is this. The source of the problem, and remember the problem is unbelief, the source of the problem is the will of man. The solution to the problem is the grace of God. And so, fortunately for all of us, God's grace is far stronger than our stubborn, disobedient, rebellious wills are. And as he turns into the follow-up from here, now he's beginning to turn his back on the grumblers and turning his attention to those who, those who believe. It's interesting, we could maybe make the case that this is one of those places where we ought not to be imitators of Jesus, because as we're going to see time and again, when he runs into grumblers and those who, un, who, those who are unbelievers, he very often just dismisses them. He can do that because we know he's God come in the flesh. He knows what's in their hearts. We can't do that. And so, we are to treat everybody with love and compassion. Not that he doesn't do the same, but we can't just look at somebody when they don't believe the message we give them and turn our back and walk away because we're not Jesus. So the follow-up is this. He says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
Not that any man has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. So the focus here is more on those who believe, immediately present there with him physically, but also extending to the modern day and, and to us. And when he's quoting the prophets, and it's generally recognized that he's quoting a passage, not directly word for word, but he's quoting a passage from Isaiah, which also shouldn't surprise us because of how closely the teachings of Jesus coincide with Isaiah. And then not surprisingly, John's message, as we've seen, ties in very closely to Isaiah. So when Jesus said, and they shall all be taught of God, I think there's a bit of a double entendre here. One is that what he's saying is, some have come to me in faith, others are grumbling. The ones we see coming to me in faith are coming to me in faith because they've been taught by God. Because God the Father has taught them somehow, they've come to me whereas the others haven't. But the other thing he's saying, tying into the key point of John's gospel itself, who is Jesus? He is God come in the flesh. And so when Isaiah said, God speaking through Isaiah said, they shall all be taught of God, who is the one standing here speaking to them teaching? It is God come in the flesh. And so there's that aspect of it of it as well. People there wouldn't have recognized that. We do because we have the benefit of hindsight and the whole of Scripture. So ultimately this is pointing to who it is that's standing there talking to them. The one who knows the Father, the one who's seen the Father because he's the one who's come from the Father. And then not missing an opportunity to preach the gospel, that's what he does. Remember when we went through the book of Acts, what was Paul's response to everything that happened? Does something good happen? Preach the gospel. Does something bad happen? Preach the gospel. If you get beaten up and dragged outside the city and left for dead, what do you do? Go back into the city and preach the gospel. And so that kind of is at the core of what we should be doing practically, and Jesus models this here too. And so he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he shall live forever, and the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. So what he's doing here is he's going back to what he said in John 6.35, where he said, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never, shall never thirst. We're not going to go into what he says here because some has overlapped from last week, and then the rest really comes to a head when he focuses on what this means to eat his flesh and, and drink his blood. But the one thing we ought to note is what's coming up time and time again? Believing. He who believes. The one who believes. And every single instance we've seen from John chapter 1 until now, every single one of those times we see reference to believing, it's always been the same participle construction, which means, yes, it's whoever believes. Yes, we have to believe. But it's not just what we do. It's what we are. It's the believing ones. We are the believing ones. So you're getting the point that John is hammering home again and again and again every opportunity he gets, which comes directly from Jesus. It's an ongoing call to keep on believing. So week by week as we go through John's Gospel, the core call is keep on believing. Keep on believing. It's great that you believed yesterday. It's great that you believed this morning, and that's why we're here, but keep on believing. So what we want to do is we want to focus on just a few of the key details in here, and we'll get to the core of why it is that we can have comfort and strength and assurance in Jesus. But to see that, we have to start with the problem of the will. Ultimately, unbelief is a problem of the will. So notice in John 6, Jesus said to them, immediately on the heels of their grumbling, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So it's important we understand what is he talking about when he says no one can come to me. It's not an issue of there are multitudes of people out there who are desperately seeking after God and they want to go to him and he's turning his back and saying, nope, not you. Nope, door's closed, can't come in. That's not the picture the Bible paints at all. It's not a matter of all these people are trying to chase after God and he's turning his back. It's quite the opposite. It's a matter of nobody wants to. And so it maybe sounds like a subtle thing, but unbelief is not a matter of we cannot because we will not, but, or sorry, it is a matter of we cannot because we will not, rather than we will not because we cannot. So the problem is not with ability. The problem is with desire. So the problem is not that we inherently are unable to come to God, it's we're un inherently unwilling. The fundamental problem of human nature is not that we don't have free will. The fundamental problem of human nature is that we do have free will. That's the problem. God has given us the freedom to choose what we want, to chase after whatever we desire. We have that freedom, and that's what leads us astray. Think about how the Bible paints this picture of us with our free will running 
headlong away from God. Matthew 23, Jesus looking out over Jerusalem just before he goes to the cross, says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, and he's going to be added to that list in a matter of hours, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Not that you weren't able, you weren't willing, you didn't want it. I've tried and I've tried and how often God sent prophets and they turned their back and they turned their back. Even in John 3.19, we read this, right on the heels of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then three short verses later, Jesus said, and this is the judgment that the light is come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. And so the problem is the will and the direction it's oriented. Romans chapter 3, Paul makes this point clear, quoting from the Old Testament. He says, as it's written, there is no one righteous, maybe one, no, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good. Maybe just one? No, not even one. And so the problem is not lack of ability. The problem is our desire. The problem is our free will. And that is that we love ourselves. By nature, we love ourselves more than anything else in the world. That's how we're born. But the solution is the grace of God. Because the very next thing Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And then we go on and we read about the drawing of God in verse 45 and 47. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life, or the believing one has eternal life. So notice the sequence that Jesus teaches us here. <clears throat> it begins with the drawing of the Father. And so the Father draws people. <clears throat> How? They shall be taught of God. And so this drawing is through the Holy Spirit. Think about John chapter 1, where we read this. Very first week, we started looking at John's Gospel. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And that's what we are, as children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, to all the believing ones, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. And so it's through the working of the Holy Spirit who gives us understanding of that word that's preached to us, who teaches us that word of God, who helps us to understand it, and then who creates faith in it. The Bible never says God believes for us. We're called to believe. Think about the working of the Holy Spirit that Jesus talked about in John chapter 3 when he was speaking to Nicodemus. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel, I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. But do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And so it's not necessarily something we feel or perceive or are sensible about. It's just one minute what we didn't believe, what we didn't understand from the Bible now starts to make a little bit of sense. And now it starts to seem real. And now we believe it. And now it starts to become a part of our life. And now we start to live out in accordance with that. And if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus and the other Bible writers taught us that God was at work behind the scenes making these things come to pass, we would think we did it all on our own. <clears throat> so why is it that we don't understand this? It's because God doesn't hijack us. What he does is he gently draws us. Think about the picture from our section in Scripture reading in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. And this is hiding behind what Paul is writing, the working of the Holy Spirit. He says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Think about the picture elsewhere in the Bible about how we have blind eyes and God opens them. We have deaf ears and God opens them so we can hear. We have hard hearts and God softens them. And then verse 8, for by grace you've been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. So we believe, God doesn't believe for us, but as he makes us alive on the inside, and he shows us the truth of his word, we believe, and we can't, we can't help but believe. And this drawing, this gentle drawing, is exactly what the Apostle Paul speaks about, prays for, in Ephesians 1, where he says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. This same gentle and loving drawing is pictured in the Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 4. Draw me after you, and let us run together, 
The king has brought me into his chambers. We will rejoice in you and be glad. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. And so it's a gentle and loving drawing of God that draws us to him. But we're not just drawn to God in Christ, but Jesus, in fact, promises that that one he will raise up on the last day. And so when God drew us to Christ, not only did he draw us to Christ, he united us to Christ through the working of the Holy Spirit, so that we're one, Christ abiding in us and us in him. And he is spiritually raised up with Christ because of our union with him. Think about our second scripture reading, Ephesians chapter 2. But God being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. And now, what did Jesus promise? I will raise him up in the last day. And what does the Apostle Paul say? When God made us alive together with Christ, he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so right now, spiritually, we're seated in heaven with Christ, in Christ, because of our union with him. That's the first installment of Jesus' promise to raise us up. And why did he do this? Verse 7, in order that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. The amazing grace we sang about in second and third songs this morning. But not only have we been raised up spiritually with Christ now, and are we seated with him in heaven, but the final installment will be brought about when Jesus returns. Because as Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. And so we're not just drawn to God in Christ, we're united with him, we're raised up with him now spiritually and in the future physically to spend eternity with him. So as we bring things to a close, ultimately, hopefully what we recognize, this isn't a passage about grumbling, that was done away with in the first half of one verse. That's done and in the past. Jesus didn't even really worry about the grumblers. He was speaking to the believers. And ultimately, today's passage is a message about the love of God, the grace of God, and the faithfulness of God in Christ through the working of the Spirit. And that is because in spite of our weaknesses and in spite of our failures, we stand in Christ because we've been raised up with him spiritually now and we will be raised up physically with him later. And so regardless of how weak we are, we stand in Christ now and forevermore because of the unconditional love of God. And as we've read, it is this unconditional love of God that draws us. Ephesians 2, 4 again and 5. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of his great love. Notice the cause, the moving cause is God's love. And why does God love us this way? Because God is love. It is what he is by his very nature. We spent the better part of a year looking at that. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. Think about in Romans 5 where Paul says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Second Timothy, Paul writes, God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Titus 3, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we'd done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Think about how different the love of God towards us is compared to our love for others. doesn't matter what relationship we're in, with a parent, with a child, spouse, sibling, friends, whoever, we will have conflict. It's a part of life. Conflict is a natural part of life. Sometimes that conflict is prolonged. And during that time of conflict, it's easy to feel that the other person doesn't love you back. Sometimes maybe they really don't love you back. So what does human nature do? Human nature tends to cause us to get frustrated tends to cause us to get tired, tends to eventually cause us to just turn our back and walk away. That's not this unconditional love of God because our father didn't get frustrated, turn his back and walk away. Instead, what did our father in heaven do? He sent his son to the cross for us. And then he sent us his Holy Spirit so that we would be his beloved children for all eternity. Stop and marvel about how deeply God loves us and all that he's done for us. Two months ago, first Sunday of December, our reflective video during the Lord's Supper was Who You Say I Am, Hillsong. And they're reflecting on this very idea. So think about the words that we reflected on in that video. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. 
Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I am a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Remember the quick pop quiz we had that day? So what are you? I'm a child of God. We should never forget that because of the love of God. And so when we recognize this, when we recognize just how deep the love and grace of God goes and how it doesn't depend on us and how we don't have to worry about our weakness and our frailty and our failings because the love of God surpasses all of that, it's then we look to Christ and we realize that in Him and in Him alone our hope is found. Does that sound familiar? John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Last verse of in Christ alone sings of this very hope. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here, in the power of Christ I'll stand. And nothing could be more comforting than that. And we have the benefit of that because some people grumbled. So thank you to the grumbling Israelites. And our song of response this morning is a song where we look at how the mystery of divine grace and love, something that we can believe but it's hard to understand, how that and our life and our experience and our will all kind of come together and we rejoice recognizing that from beginning to end our lives are in the hands of the Lord. And that song is, I Sought the Lord. So let's stand and join together singing, I Sought the Lord.